This is the second part of a short story entitled Time is Running Out. Uh, it's written by J.R. Foxwell and read by the author and available at jrfoxwell.wordpress.com. I lay back on the bed, memories of our last time together coming back to my mind. Round and round they went, until the kiss she gave me on the forehead became almost sinister and morbid. Perhaps she was hiding a great illness. Those beautiful eyes, could they be so tranquil because they've embraced the fate of death? Could she be at one with silence because she's at peace, with no words left to say? Dear God, did she kiss me while on her way to a final resting place? Is that what she meant by time is running out? Was she about to commit suicide? I couldn't bear it. I tossed and turned all night. The bed covers were wet through with sweat. In the morning I scoured the bases of the cliffs, first by foot and then in the afternoon by boat. But I reached the same place as yesterday, standing in front of the mirror in my hotel room, with just as much nothing as the day before. This time I could see my frown had returned. I could see it standing on my eyebrows, forcing them to suffocate my eyes. I put on my glasses and stared at myself again. I was amazed. My grey haggard face, scowling brow and horn-rimmed spectacles afforded no expression of my personality whatsoever. At least not the personality I'd found while I'd been here. I had my sleeping pills ready. I always took them the day before I flew. I don't know when it started, perhaps it's all based in a fear of heights I had when I was a boy. But every flight terrifies me. I've managed to adapt to handle everything but the takeoff and the landing. And if I can just squeeze my seat enough while they're happening, I can get through. I awoke and saw the grey-faced man with horn-rimmed spectacles dress himself with shirt and tie and follow the customary hotel leaving routine to the letter. Bags by the door, one last look round the room, especially under the bed, followed by a full cup of black instant coffee and the consumption of the two saved butter biscuits that would have to serve as an early breakfast. The clunk of the door, the smell of freshly vacuumed hallway carpet. The automaton carried me all the way to the check-in desk, passport from top right jacket pocket, then returned with boarding pass marking the mugshot page within it. And then there I was, sitting in seat C on row 15, staring at the grey panel in front of me, thinking that I could have been looking in the mirror, when the memories came back. I'd automated the whole process so carefully that I hadn't allowed my fears to surface, but now she was a prophetess, staring into my eyes with the glowing sunset behind her, her kiss a symbol of completion, a goodbye forever. Time is running out for me, I whispered to myself. I shrugged it off, but something was sticking, when she spoke those words, she was looking straight at me. Not at the sky as though it was for all of us, or down as if it was for her. No, it was for me. I was sure of it. The plane began to taxi, and I felt a cold shiver go down my spine. I could feel the blood draining away from my face. All I could think was that I wasn't ready. There's so much I want to do. I saw her eyes looking at me, with at one with the silence. Why weren't my eyes like that? Why wasn't I ready to die? I began to get hot and nauseous, and in the middle of my brief dance with insanity, the answers to the questions I never wanted to ask myself came flooding over me. I'd never loved. I'd never chosen my life. I was as grey as the back of the chair in front, as pointless, as irrelevant, and I couldn't go out like that. I couldn't go out like that. The engines were whining, and my chair began to shake. I could see my fingers, a yellow-white, clasped round the armrest. I closed my eyes. I felt I was spinning. When I awoke, I was on the ground, and a stewardess was explaining that they had to state me. Apparently, I was screaming during takeoff. My life back in Geneva was hectic. But wherever I was, there was a mirror. I couldn't forget the irrelevance of my own face. It ate away at me little by little. Until one morning in mid November, when everything changed. I woke up early. I felt incredible peace. 
Something had shifted within me. I was avoiding it no longer. From somewhere, courage had arisen, and now it was taking me on a journey. I got myself dressed, smiled at a different face in the mirror, slowly walked down the stairs, surveying the scene as though it were not familiar, as though it were not my life. I reached for my coat and buttoned it up tight, enjoying the feelings of the buttons on my fingers. And there I was, standing there in the doorway. I stretched out my arms as though I were floating on euphoria. Then I took off my glasses, folded them neatly, and placed them on the table under the coat rack, and walked out the door. Time is running out, I said. Time is running out.